Welcome to Free Speech Unmuted. I'm Eugene Wallach. I'm a professor at UCLA Law School and a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford. And I'm Jane Bambauer. I'm professor of law and also the Breckner Eminent Scholar at the Department of Journalism at the University of Florida. And today we are discussing uh, the Murthy versus Missouri case that was just argued before the Supreme Court. Uh, it it starts with a an injunction that uh, was well left in place by the Fifth Circuit that enjoins the Biden administration from and I'm quoting here threatening, pressuring, or coercing social media companies in any manner to remove, delete, suppress, or reduce posted content of postings. Uh, uh, containing protected free speech. So the background context is that during the pandemic and also the 2020 election, uh, many of the major social media companies were routinely in contact with the federal government to get uh, advice, but also uh, to you know receive, I guess, communications that certainly seemed pressuring and maybe even went across the line into threatening. Uh, some of the things that happened, so, so first of all, every major social media company had regular uh, contact with the federal government where they would receive recommendations for which types of misinformation ought to be removed or downgraded or that sort of thing. Um, they had regular uh, meetings, but some of them also had special partner support portals where the government's recommendations for content moderation would be prioritized automatically. Um, but then maybe more concerning, there were thousands of emails that were disclosed during discovery in this case, where the government was asking, you know, where, where uh, White House staff were asking, why is this post still up? Or you know, I don't think their position is that it needs to be removed, but slowing it down seems reasonable. These are these are quotes. Um, and then also there were both private and public statements that may have worked together to create uh, some pressure or even, uh, you know, vague threats. Uh, quotes like you're you're hiding the ball uh, We that we feel that Facebook was not trying to solve the problem. Um, the White House is internally considering our considering our options for what to do about it. And then during public press statements, um, the press secretary said, well, President Biden himself said that these social media companies were killing people. And then a few days later, the press secretary said that the White House was reviewing what to do about the legal liability of the platforms um, and considering things like Section 230, changing Section 230, the immunity, the, the statute that currently gives immunity to these platforms uh, from against uh, tort liability, um, and maybe even uh, enacting antitrust reforms. So, uh, Eugene, do you want to add anything to the factual context? I, I bet we'll pull out more facts, too, as we discuss the case. But is there anything up front we should know before we talk about what the Supreme Court has said before? Well, this uh, has to do with the, the legal framing of the facts. The important thing is that this case is at least two major issues which are related but different. One of them has to do with whether the government was impermissibly coercing the platforms, impermissibly pressuring the platforms to remove speech. And I think it's pretty broadly agreed that if it were coercing them, that would violate the First Amendment. But there's a big dispute about whether there was such coercion. The separate question is whether, even apart from coercion, the fact that the government was encouraging them or requesting them to remove certain material or downgrade it or whatever else, whether that is also a First Amendment violation. And there, factually, it does seem pretty clear the government was making some such requests, but it's not at all clear uh, uh, whether that is, in fact, uh, unconstitutional. So it may be worth yeah. keeping the two items uh, separate uh, uh, because uh, while they arise out of the same facts, uh, uh, they really are very different legal theories. Well, even, even the way the injunction was phrased, threatening, pressuring, or coercing. I think you and I, most people would, would agree that threatening and coercing, those, uh, those kind of work hand in hand in terms of uh, laying into the, uh, you know, into in, into a distributor of, of speech uh, in a manner that suggests that if they don't do it, something bad is going to happen. Pressuring is more vague. And I guess that's, that's sort of what we're going to be 
getting into the weeds on. Well, if if I could if I could take a slightly different view, I think that the pressuring is kind of close to coercion, uh, at least in this kind of context. But um, there is. A, uh, uh, there is a very much a live question before the court whether even in the absence of pressure, if it's merely requests, if it's merely encouragement, even if it is pretty far removed from coercion, whether that itself is unconstitutional. That raises some of the most interesting uh, uh, legal issues as opposed to just factual disputes over whether there was or was not enough pressure. Yeah. OK, so what has the Supreme Court said before? Well, Back in 1963, there was a case called Bantam Books v. Sullivan, uh, which uh, basically held that when the government tries to exert coercive pressure in order to block speech, that itself can be a First Amendment violation. In that context, there was a specialized Rhode Island government agency that was fighting obscenity. At the time, obscenity wasn't just today super hardcore porn. Back then, it included a lot of material that would be pretty tame by today's standards. So this commission, instead of getting an injunction, let's say, or pro uh, against, uh, uh, against uh, uh, the distribution of certain books or prosecuting people, instead of that, it just went to the bookstores and said, you know, we think this material that you're selling is obscene. And uh, uh, we're hoping you just take it down or else we might have to call in the big boys, call in the prosecutors, call in the police and the like. And the court said, you know, that may not actually be a prosecution itself. It may just be a threat, but that is certainly enough to make for a First Amendment violation. So that's the law about coercion. And the real question in a lot of these cases uh, is, is there or is there uh, not enough evidence that there's actually coercion going on there? I should say there was a case argued the same day, rising out of very different facts, called NRA v. Vullo. Uh, I was the counsel of record. I didn't argue the case, but I was the lawyer, uh, uh, one of the lawyers on the briefs, uh, uh, which involves just the coercion side. I'm not going to talk about that case because I was a lawyer for it. But this issue does come up. It come, came up in that case, came up in Murphy. Now, the other side, the, the encouragement question, well, that's not at all clear. There have been times when the Supreme Court has said, well, if the government substantially encourages private action, then it's in a sense responsible for that action. I'll give you an example. The Supreme Court hasn't said this uh, but uh, uh, as to the Fourth Amendment, but some lower courts have said that if the police call someone up and say, oh, you're a private person, we're not trying to force you to do anything. If you say no, no problem. But we're hoping you might engage in uh, you might search through somebody else's property, like maybe you're a landlord and you're entitled to go in and look around uh, in your tenant's apartment. Uh, but why don't you do that and, and report back to us? That kind of substantial encouragement would be viewed as enough to make that search into a government search uh, governed by Fourth Amendment uh, uh, principles. Likewise, there was a case called Norwood v. Harrison, which involved actually substantial government support uh, for the segregationist academies that uh, grew up in the South as part of its uh, uh, part of its uh, attempt to fight uh, in racial integration in the schools. And the court there said, well, if when the government provides that support that substantially encourages uh, the, the segregationist academies and thus makes them subject to the Equal Protection Clause. But what about in the First Amendment context? Can the government just sort of urge people to uh, not say things or to not allow other people to say things on their platforms, let's say not uh, urge a newspaper not to run an op-ed uh, uh, in its pages. That's something uh, that there really isn't a lot of precedent on. As we'll see, there's some pretty strong suspicion that the government at least is very often allowed to do that. But there's no clear precedent on the subject the way there is with Bantam Books on coercion. Okay. Yeah. So, so, yeah. So I agree when it comes to the First Amendment, it's likely to be or at least it could very well be a different uh, level of encouragement or pressure that uh, before the state action doctrine kicks in or before. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I, I I do think that one reason this case is so hard is that Bantam Books itself left a, you know, left rule language that was a bit vague. Uh, it could have been uh, it could have been a rule that honed a little clo closer to the facts there, but it, the court said instead that the threat of invoking legal sanctions and other means of 
and other means of coercion, persuasion, and intimidation would count. And it's like that word persuasion just leaves a lot of questions because I think we yeah. can all agree the government needs to be able to persuade some people to do some things um, without having to um, directly, you know, use public law to order everyone to do things. So, so okay, so the Fifth Circuit's test, I kind of like, I wish it were just uh, you know, I don't necessarily agree with the application to the facts here, but but what the Fifth Circuit said, or at least this is my reading, um, is they are going to use coercion as a line, but also um, or, or significant encouragement. And the way that they define significant encouragement is maybe a little bit differently from uh, the sort of encouragement that Eugene was just talking about with the Fourth Amendment. They say significant encouragement must, uh, there has to be a, a close nexus between the parties that the government is, so that the government is practically responsible for the decision, right? Um, and so, and, and then as they apply that test to the facts, to me, I think what they're trying to do is they're trying to say there are two ways that private act, what would otherwise be a private decision could become the state's responsibility. One way is through pressuring of the sort that reaches that coercion line. And I think even that, we're going to have a lot to say about that and we may disagree. But there's another way. This other way is that even if the even if the um uh the, the private decision maker totally voluntarily hands over the reins to the government so that the government is making these basically micromanaged decisions, that would be enough. You know, outsourcing that kind of judgment to the government could itself also be a First Amendment viol uh, a first, uh, you know, could, could be, could implicate the First Amendment um, for reasons that theoretically may be distinct from the coercion point. So first of all, Eugene, do you disagree with that interpretation of what the Fifth Circuit was trying to do? I can give you some examples of why I think this is what they were trying to do, but, but let me first see it. So the Fifth Circuit in this case was trying to come up with a line between on the one hand, the government can talk so long as it's non-coercively to people all the time and urge them to remove things and work hand in hand with them to remove things. Uh, and that's all perfectly fine, no matter how systemic, no matter how, how organized that is, um, so long as there's no coercion. Uh, so they mm -hmm. wanted- You think that's what the Fifth Circuit was saying? No, they, they didn't want to go that far. Oh, okay. Likewise, didn't okay. want to go too far on the other side, where every time the government right, okay. pulls up a newspaper and says, you know, I think what you are about to publish is just false. And wouldn't it be better for everybody if you didn't? Uh, that, that that would be somehow unconstitutional. So the Fifth Circuit didn't want that. So they were trying to come up with some line in between. I think what they were focusing on is whether it's really kind of a persistent, systemic, working hand in glove with a private entity. In which case you might think of it as uh, as uh, um, uh, this entanglement, as this joint action by yeah. government, jo program of joint action versus Correct. just occasional, you know, somebody calls somebody up. It's an exactly. interesting question whether that kind of line makes sense uh, because it would require, among other things, a lot of judgment calls about how systemic is systemic. There's a, there's one of my favorite lines uh, from a song is from Suzanne Vega's uh, song. The line is, uh, um, it's a one-time thing. It just happens a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, well, they so, do. So it, it, it's hard to know if the Fifth Circuit figured it out, but that's what I think the Fifth Circuit was trying to do. I agree. And I just I just want to clarify, I, I wish that they ex explained that this test is not a single way that the government may um, implicate the First Amendment here. It's actually two different paths. I mean, they might go they, they might go hand in hand, but you can coerce or you can work so closely that you're basically in a, in a case of joint decision making. In cahoots. In cahoots. Yeah. And they did contrast. You know, they said that there was this. Um, the California Secretary of State had this system where they were they were flagging a whole bunch of election misinformation, um, and every single time they did it, the social media companies took it down. But that that was purely optional, and that it it was a purely optional suggestion. Yes, it happened a lot, but it wasn't like the social media companies, uh, I, I guess, formally handed over decision making. I'm not I'm not sure you know, what we would have had to see, but they, the, the Fifth Circuit said that that was not a problem. So you're right that they're trying to find a, a middle way. Okay, 
So then I think we should talk about how the parties crafted their arguments here. Uh, do you want to take us through what the uh, Biden administration's argument was? Only if I get to take us through this at a very oversimplified level, because it was a long, <laughs> long argument. And both sides' argument was a long argument. Um, uh, basically, they first of all, they said some things about some procedural questions related to standing, related to whether there's enough proof that these particular plaintiffs were um, uh, were affected here. Tremendously important legal question. I'm going to take the liberty of just bracketing it here because, because it, while important in this case, uh, I don't think it's, it, it's not central to the free speech issues as such and to the broader legal principles uh, uh, involved here. But the government's view was basically this. We didn't coerce. The, the, the conclusions of the lower courts that there was coercion were just not, not justified. Uh, we were just urging, we were just requesting, not coercing. And among other things, you know, these platforms, they're not just like some small mom and pop bookshop who might be overawed by the power of the federal government. They're very powerful entities on their own. So uh, we weren't coercing. And when it comes to encouragement, we may have been encouraging, we may have been trying to persuade, but that's perfectly fine. We are entitled to speak too. Maybe it's Maybe it's not clear that the federal government as such has free speech rights as such under the First Amendment, but at the very least, it's a legitimate thing for the government to talk to people and try to persuade them, uh, including try to persuade them not to say things or not to join particular groups or not to allow certain speech on their private property. That was the heart uh, of um, uh, the argument that the, the, that the Solicitor General's office representing the federal government was making. Okay, let, let's listen to a couple examples of that. First, we're getting to listen to the Solicitor General respond to some questions from Justice Gorsuch. I think there can. I think you know, often a threat or an inducement is sort of the flip side, one or the other. I think in the next case, you could construe it either way, threat of prosecution, offer of leniency. So we acknowledge that it can be both, but it has to be a threat or an inducement of some concrete government action, not just a more government speech. And hypothetically, and I'm not saying this happened here, but would a threat or an inducement with respect to any trust actions qualify as coercion? Sure. And uh, a threat or an inducement with respect to Section 230 qualify? So I think that one's harder um, for two reasons. One is that these are executive branch officials who don't have the ability to unilaterally enact 230 reform. I think the question but they, is... they have a power to influence that. Influence and, that, but the question is... Would, is that, it, would that be enough to say we're going to... Uh, if you don't do X, we are going to change our position on Section 230. So potentially, yes, as to legislation. 230, if I could just get this out, though, I think sure. is different because 230 is about content moderation. It's, a, it's, it's about this very issue. And I think a government official has to be able to say, I support Section 230 reform because I'm concerned about these things. And also, in the meantime, well, I think platforms I, should be doing better. I understand that. But in terms of advocating for change of Section 230, that could be coercion in your view. Okay, so I, I find it so, so. It seemed that the the solicitor general conceded that um, that if there were a, a a threat, do this, otherwise we will consider antitrust enforcement or or something. That that uh, that would be enough for coercion. What did you make of the section two thirty response? Well, right. So when you're talking about coercion, there are often questions about what what counts as coercive enough. On one hand. Anytime somebody who's powerful enough says something to someone, there may be some coercive uh, subtext. On the other hand, even powerful people and entities need to be able to speak. Uh, just an analogy that comes to my mind is when it comes to employer speech to employees about unionization, employers are allowed to, to tell their employees, we think it's a bad idea for you to vote for a union for the following reasons. But at the same time, the Supreme Court has uh, made clear that uh, uh, the um, uh, courts ought to police things a little bit more closely when it's the employer talking to employees rather than just some politician talking to the voters because the employees realize that they could get fired by the employer uh, and that as a result might uh, notice subtle threats in situations where, uh, where 
absent that kind of uh, 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 power over them, uh, this wouldn't be seen as threatening. So that's one dimension of, of what counts as a threat. The other is a threat of what? Let's say uh, the president says, uh, we're going to need to have new laws that regulate you if you don't regulate yourselves. It's actually not a, a not uncommon uh, thing that uh, government officials have, have said. I think it was said at one point about violent video games, about various other things. You know, the president can't pass a new law. Uh, so in a sense, the uh, the statement is less likely to be seen as threatening, maybe more a warning that, well, you know, you've you got to understand what the political dynamic is like, is like more broadly. At the same time, the president is, as a practical matter in our system, um, the head of his party. And especially when his party is in power, uh, a statement that says, you know, a new law might be passed is something that uh, uh, that could be seen as I will talk to the people I work very closely with in Congress to make sure that the new law is passed. Yeah. OK, so uh, so e even if the threatened new law is, might run afoul of the First Amendment, I, I think I agree with you that even in that case, it's like good luck, good luck trying to pass yeah. that law and then good luck enforcing right. it. But, right. Just to be just to be clear, though, the Section 230 reform may very well not. I be. agree. I agree. I agree. But I'm right. just the, I'm, I'm, yeah. Um, the question is whether the threat, I mean, a lot of threats uh, uh, in this kind of situation might be the threat to do something that you're legally entitled to do. But no, that would be aimed at suppressing speech. That may very well uh, be an impermissible speech restriction. OK, I think we agree on that. Um, but, but threatening something like antitrust to me, I, I'm wondering if you think that that is equivalent to threatening something like firing you for, for, for um, for trying to, to unionize where the action doesn't have direct relevance, you know, that the, the sort of punishment doesn't have direct relevance to the, um, to, to the, the statement, you know, this the speech that the that that the um that the government was trying to suppress. Well, I think uh, uh, it, it just just to give an example, and it's only struck a structural analogy. Uh, I'm not saying it's morally equivalent, but but it reminds us of how broadly threats could operate. If I say, uh, "Pay me some money, or I will burn down your restaurant," you know, the threat of burning something down is not logically connected to the uh, to the payment of the money uh but it's Correct. still it's still a powerful threat because it oh, is no, a threat yeah. of of harmful retaliation so likewise a threat that we're going to enforce some other law against you if you don't uh, yeah i'm saying it's more i think that's more of a threat right i would see that as more coercive precisely because it's not relevant Oh, I see. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it's an the... interesting question. More coercive, less coercive. Oh, okay. I do think here's what everybody agrees on in this case. Uh, if indeed the government's statements are reasonably perceived as coercive, then this Bantam Books v. Sullivan precedent I mentioned comes into play. And that is that kind of threat is presumptively unconstitutional. Uh, because it's government coercion aimed at restricting speech. Then the, what people disagree on is whether it was coercive enough here. And the other thing they disagree on, which we'll be getting to shortly, is what happens if, if it isn't coercive, but if it is government working closely, hand in hand uh, with the private entities? Is that enough to be a First Amendment violation even in the absence of coercion. That's another thing that people disagree on. Yeah, okay. So let's now listen to a clip with uh, Justice Kagan. And like Justice Kavanaugh, I've had some um, experience encouraging press <laughs> to suppress their own speech. Um, uh, you just wrote a bad editorial. Here are the five reasons you shouldn't write another one. You just um, wrote a story that's filled with factual errors. Here are the 10 reasons why you shouldn't do that again. Um, uh, I mean, this happens literally thousands of times a day in the federal government. Uh, so Justice Kavanaugh and Justice Kagan uh, had both been in, uh, uh, in the administration. Um, Justice uh, uh, Kavanaugh in the Bush Jr. administration, Justice Kagan in the Clinton administration. So Justice Kavanaugh had some, said something earlier, not long, not long before, and Justice Kagan was picking up on that. 
I think what they're describing is the reality and probably uh, often a benign, maybe even a positive reality of the way the government interacts with the media. Uh, so, so let's say, for example, uh, um, uh, the government learns that there's going to be a new op-ed published about, uh, let's say, some law enforcement actions. And so the police chief calls up the newspaper and says, look, I can't force you to do anything. You know that I can't force you to do anything. You're a newspaper. You defend your First Amendment rights. I'm not trying to restrict your First Amendment rights. But what I am telling you is if you run this op-ed, it's going to undermine our investigation. As a result, this person who we think committed a serious crime is not going to get properly prosecuted. Up to you, but look, I just we're just trying to appeal to your sense of good citizenship. I think I, I think it's pretty broadly agreed that that's permissible. Here's another thing that's that's permissible and uh, uh, and I think is is often very valuable. Um, somebody so the government learns that there's an op-ed that's just going to say things that are wrong, that are false. Yeah, right. maybe the way it learns it is that somebody, some fact checker, calls them up. Uh, uh, at the outset, but even if even if it's not that, even if they're the ones who are calling and say, "Look, here are the facts. Here is here is why your op-ed is is incorrect, or maybe unfair, or just misleading, or spins things in the wrong way." We just want to lay out the facts for you because we assume you want op-eds on your pages to be accurate. Uh, mm -hmm. We assume you want your readers mm -hmm. to be well informed. We assume yes. you don't want to look like <laughs> fools when it comes out that the op-ed you published turns out to be completely wrong. We're not trying to coerce you, but we're hoping we're going to persuade you into not, to not running falsehood. So and, here, I, here's, that, that's probably the sort of thing that is good if the government does, at least in certain situations. I completely agree. And I really wish that the plaintiff's lawyers had conceded that because that seems totally obviously a useful way of not, not only having information flow where relevant and valid from the government to uh, its citizens, um, but, um, but, but al al also avoiding sort of mm -hmm. constitutional crises where the government is trying to manage things through, you know, public, you know, draconian public law. So but the trouble is, though, that's just not what happened here. Right. So they did not they did not say, hey, just for your information, I want you to know you're saying something a little bit wrong. You may not realize this, but this is this, there's all this vaccine misinformation here. No, they said we're talking internally about what to do. Right, considering our options for what to do about it, uh, and then they're interspersing, you know, in addition to the back channel connect, uh, conversations that are going on over the course of a few days, not very long. We also have, you know, two um, press conferences where, uh, or at least one press conference where the uh, press secretary said that the goal, the president has the goal of including possible reforms to Section 230 and antitrust reforms in the context of the misinformation crisis, right? How is that similar to Justice? I'm sure Justice Kavanaugh did all the right things, but he did not say or else or else, right? <laughs> right. So so again, you're focusing, I think, quite correctly on this coercion question, whether there was enough here in the record that shows that the uh, platforms were being actually coerced or at least pressured through threat into doing so. Right. right. And th again, there's an important factual issue whether there is sufficient evidence of that. But there's also the separate argument, which uh, uh, the the challengers uh, uh, um, uh, brought up and which the Fifth Circuit in some measure accepted. And that is, even apart from coercion, substantial encouragement might be enough. And in fact, uh, uh, the uh, the Fifth Circuit, as to one particular uh, government agency, uh, actually said for for the statements by this agency, we don't think there's really enough here to show coercion, but we do think there's enough to show substantial encouragement, and that alone, even in the absence of coercion, uh, may be unconstitutional. So that's in a sense, so, and they that, that's the more even, interesting legal question here, as opposed to whether it was not coercion, which is a factual question. Also, well, interesting, but less less of a uh, likely to set a big, big precedent. 
I, well, I don't know about that. I think this is one of these cases where the facts that, you know, that the intertwinement of the facts and the law matter a lot. And if, if the Supreme Court says there was no coercion here, that the rule is coercion and there was no coercion here, it's going to be a big deal, I think. Fair enough. However, That's a very good point. I do think the Fifth Circuit, though, did get something terribly wrong, which is that they said, basically, as a matter of law, anytime the FBI privately suggests that information should not be posted, that that is automatically coercive. Um, that And so it, it's, uh, you know, it's a special sub rule, I guess, that the FBI, FBI statements are automatically coercive. I just, I, I think that's wrong. I think it's bad policy as well. The FBI needs to be able to talk about um, threats to cybersecurity and to, you know, tr likely child pornography, likely terrorism, all sorts of things. They need to be able to give information without it being automatically coercive. Okay, but let's listen to what the plaintiff's position actually was. <laughs> um, here's a clip with, uh, with the Louisiana um, uh, Solicitor General just uh, responding to Amy Con uh, Judge Coney Barrett's questions. No, go ahead. I, I want to go back to actually your interchange with Justice Kagan about the standards, because I have to confess it left me very confused. It sounded like you are articulating different standards depending on a different legal standard depending on different factual circumstances. For example, when Justice Kagan gave you the hypothetical of pressure being placed on the New York Times or the Washington Post not to run a particular op-ed, it seemed like you backed off and said, well, significant encouragement wouldn't be enough there because the person who wrote the op-ed can go to another news outlet. You also made the point that this is just different because social media is such a concentrated industry, which is a point that Justice Gorsuch was asking Mr. Fletcher about. So can you clarify, did I, did I misunderstand? Because it seems to me that as a matter of law, the same legal standard would have to apply across all of these areas. I think that's right, Your Honor, and I apologize if I wasn't clear earlier. I guess the top line legal standard I would start with was this court's line at 635 in Norwood, which is the court can't do indirectly what it's constitutionally prohibited from doing directly. The second line in response to that is, well, what sorts of indirect mechanisms can the government use um, that would run afoul of that rule? I think one potential mechanism is coercion. Another one's encouragement. This court also has used the Just term inducement. Just plain vanilla encouragement, or does it have to be some kind of like significant encouragement? Because encouragement would sweep in an awful lot. I think that's right, Your Honor. And so let me give you two answers to that. The top line answer is, I mean, I'm a First Amendment purist, and so I would say even mild encouragement, but we don't need that to win in this case because we are so far afield from whatever that, that threshold is. So if you want to say substantial encouragement, like the Fifth Circuit said, and like Bloom said, absolutely, that's a standard that works. Okay, so, so they're going for the whole pie. It, it sounds like the plaintiffs, I, I don't think this is strategically wise, but they would like the Supreme Court to say that even mild-mannered encouragement uh, is enough to trigger First Amendment application. Is that your understanding? Certainly sounded that way in, in that exchange and in some others. And if you just step back a bit, and this is a problem that I think lawyers often face. Uh, you've got one polar position, you've got another polar position. And if then there are all sorts of ones in the middle. But the ones in the middle... They, they turn on vague concepts like substantial or unreasonable. And what counts in, as one or the other, often very difficult to tell. And judges are often reluctant to, uh, to accept a, uh, a proposal that would require, especially lower, would require lower courts all the time to decide, is that substantial? Is that not substantial? So, so it's tempting to say, yep, we're giving you a clear, bright line test. But, you know, if the if uh, the justices in this case don't think that the bright line test makes sense, if they say, right. you know, we it's can't clear, get, but it's also at, absurd, at the particular poll that you're asking for, right. yeah. then uh, you risk them going to the other poll mm -hmm. rather than uh, uh, rather than uh, um, uh, doing something that's maybe halfway in between that will at least give you something of what you're asking. So I think the lawyer may have gotten so... Uh, concerned about the justices being worried about drawing the substantiality line and figuring out what really counts uh, as too much encouragement, what counts as uh, 
okay encouragement that he made a proposal that I just think most of the justices don't seem likely to be to accept. Agreed. Okay. So now, Eugene, what would you do if you get to make the rule? What would it, if you get to make the rule and you need to use these facts to help us understand the rule, right. what would it right. be? Well, so let's set aside the coercion point. Again, everybody knows that, uh, or everybody agrees that coercion is unconstitutional. Uh, that is, say, coercion on a on an entity to block speech, uh, block constitutionally protected speech on it, on its platform, uh, would be uh, unconstitutional. The question is whether there was enough coercion, and uh, that's an important factual question. I'm happy happy to leave it to you. Um, uh, but let's say, so for example, with regard to the CDC, uh, as I mentioned, the uh, the Fifth Circuit said there's not enough evidence of coercion, maybe in part because the CDC doesn't have a lot of coercive power uh, over the platforms, but there is enough evidence of, of substantial encouragement. What to do about that? It's I, I totally see the appeal of the argument that, look, encouragement is just speech. It's coercion. It's something more. But encouragement is just speech, and the government should be free to encourage people to do uh, to to not say things or not allow things on their property or what have you. Here's what strikes me as as at least a powerful insight that points in the other direction. I'm not sure it's enough to prevail, but but l let me lay it out. What I think is the strongest argument uh, for the challengers here. Um, let's look at government property. It could be the post office, which the government runs. It could be uh, meeting rooms in libraries that it's opened up to uh, to community groups. It could be classrooms uh, after hours in at universities or even public schools that it's opened up to student groups or community groups. Um, uh, when the government opens up its own property to the public, it generally speaking can't discriminate based on viewpoint on that property. So there are examples given pro, uh, in the argument, pro-terrorist speech. What about pro-terrorist speech on platforms? What about anti-Semitic speech? Well, the government cannot exclude pro-terrorist speech or anti-Semitic speech from the postal system. Even if that means that, that, that those viewpoints would then end up being distributed with the government's assistance and may cause various kinds of harm well, the government has to tolerate. But here, the federal government's position seems to be, when it comes to speech on private platforms, we can urge those platforms to try to remove uh, certain viewpoints from there. To the, and even when those platforms are much, much more important than this, these government-owned properties where viewpoint neutrality is required, we could do everything within our power, short of coercion, just in terms of persuasion, to try to get this very speech that's protected on our property to get completely excluded to the extent that we can from, from privately owned property. Now, you, right. that may be a reasonable thing. You might say, well, in one situation, uh, the government, <laughs> uh, the government at least deciding in a, in a, if not quite a coercive way, but at least in a mandatory way, what's allowed on its own property. In other situations, it's just urging people. But it seems- Well, so wait a odd. minute. Let, I, I think this is very interesting, but can the government, a genuine question here, can the government post a sign on the post office or the front of the courtroom steps or whatever or something that says- Please be civil. Just be nice to each other. No, you know, no coercion. Not even limiting the property in any way, but just a sort of encouragement to not curse or something like that. Would would uh, well, what the government think? the government could do that, uh, but uh, uh, but uh, it's pretty clear it won't have much effect. In part because it is would be urging the actual speakers themselves who have a good idea of what they want to say. So if it says oh, I see, I see, yeah. anti-Semitic okay. speech through the post office, the people who yeah. want to spread anti-Semitic speech are going yeah. uh, are, are to say, well, okay. we're not listening to you. Okay, uh, good so, point. But by so going have to a, these other distributors, okay, I see. Yeah. yeah. So we have a situation where on the one hand, there's been developed uh, over the last uh, 50 plus years, this, this, very powerful doctrine that says um, that says we want to preserve government-owned property uh, as a place where once the government opens it up to public speech, the government cannot discriminate based on viewpoint. 
We're so bothered about the government trying to interfere with the marketplace of ideas that even on its own property, uh, it it cannot discriminate based on viewpoint. Uh, so, and at the same time, the government is saying we should be we should be able to try to do everything we can, short of coercion, to try to keep those very viewpoints that we are required mm -hmm. to allow on our property, keep it off, off the of much more practically private. important property in the, yeah. in the form of, say, social media platforms. You know, uh, uh, people, uh, speech in social media platforms is practically much more significant to public debate right. than speech in uh, library uh, um, yeah. uh, library space that's open yeah, for right. community. Post office, uh, community lobbies groups. and whatnot. Yeah. So, so I think yeah. that's, that's the part of the insight on the other side. So I, I think you're actually helping me understand what the plaintiffs even meant when they said the government can't do indirectly what it's not allowed to do directly. Uh, I didn't, I, I didn't, uh, you're, you're laying out the distinction between how the government can manage its own public square versus what it can do um, to to try to convince a private public square, basically. Um, I, I, now I now I see what what may have been meant by that argument. Okay, well, so good. I I think I, I had not actually. You might actually go further than I would in that case in terms of what type of rule at least might be justifiable uh, for significant encouragement or for this stuff that's not coercive, but nevertheless. Quite effective. Um, I was I was happy with the Fifth Circuit test. I just wasn't sure that they applied it right. And I, what I wish they would have done is explain that substantial encouragement. It's not it's not sort of a subset of coercion. It's this you know as we were saying it's it's sort of working hand in glove. Um, and the only example that I thought could qualify as substantial encouragement if we keep the definition somewhat narrow uh, and, you know, sort of defensible, I think, to the, to this set of, of Supreme Court jurors, jurists, would be the example where the FBI at one time recommended to all of the platforms that they create a new category of prohibited content, the hack and leak category. And so then they all did it. And then once they had this new category of hack and leak, the FBI then subsequently uh, told, basically directed the social media companies uh, that, you know, this material, this content, this posted content, that posted content uh, qualifies as hacked and leaked content. And so they were both creating the category and administering it. And I thought, I thought that was the cleanest example of uh, substantial encouragement, which I, I think is a bad label, but for this idea of basically um, completely outsourcing this decision making to the government. Yeah. So just stepping back, uh, uh, we've been talking about state action and it's kind of obvious to us what it, what it means, but uh, it's actually a complicated concept that stems from the fact that most parts of the Constitution are addressed only to the government. So First Amendment says Congress shall make no law. Fourteenth Amendment applies that to state and local government entities. No state shall. Private entities, when when say a private platform restricts speech on its on its premises uh, or on its servers, that's not a First Amendment violation. It's an interesting debate over uh, uh, over whether um, uh, states could pass statutes that that restrict uh, uh, platforms. We talked about that not long ago. Uh, but the First Amendment itself doesn't restrict the platform. Um, uh, likewise, as I mentioned, if the police search your property, that's a Fourth Amendment violation. If I search your property, maybe that's a trespass. Maybe it's not if I have some legal right to do that, but it's not a constitutional violation. But it's not a Fourth Amendment. Sometimes right? the government interacts with private entities enough that what would otherwise seem to be private action is treated as a form of state action. So one thing is when the private action is coerced by the government, we could say, aha, the state action is the government coercion and something that would otherwise be perfectly legal becomes unconstitutional because it's really the government doing it. But another thing uh, that uh, the courts have sometimes talked about is sometimes when private entities and government entities work too closely together, uh, when, they, when they interact too much, 
uh, then that becomes essentially kind of a joint, uh, uh, joint activity, joint it's action. Enterprise, yeah. Um, uh, when somebody operates as a willful participant in joint activity with the state or its agents. So again, what exactly does that mean? Is it every time you talk to the government and sort of listen, pay attention to their to their suggestions? Is that enough? Yeah, yeah, uh, and, I, what, and I. And like as an example from this case, I don't. It, it probably wouldn't even be enough to have that system where, if, if the government itself gives a recommendation for content that should be deleted, that gets automatically prioritized. You know that. I mean, may, maybe that's enough. Maybe it's. A, may, may, but but um, but it, that would be at best, I think, a, a close call. Um, but 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 yeah, having a different, ha having another subset of cases or in an, another route to finding state action other than than uh other than coercion seems sound it sounds like to both of us well i don't know i really don't know and the beautiful thing about being an academic is it's okay to say this is a really hard question i'm not sure what the answer is maybe when i read the opinions i'll be persuaded maybe by the majority maybe by the dissent but i do think this is a genuinely difficult question uh in part because the line drawing uh, could is is very difficult if you say anything other than either the government can it never urge be private entities to restrict speech which can't be right or the government can always do it short of coercion short of coercion uh, right so so for all these reasons, I'm happy to say, I mean, I hope we've tried to explain the best arguments on both sides to, to you folks out there. Uh, but uh, what what would I do? I don't know. Thankfully, I'm, <laughs> I don't have to. <laughs> I'm not okay. the to make that decision. Well, then I'm going to ask you the, the question that I know you hate, but I'll do it anyway. What do you think these nine justices are going to do? Um, right. So from the uh, the tenor of the argument appeared to be that the justices would say, look, significant encouragement is just fine, at least so long as it's encouragement just in terms of arguing or, or, or urging rather than offering some tangible incentive that might be different. Uh, coercion, we've always said, is impermissible. But is there coercion here or not? It sounded to me like the justices would say, that the, on these facts there wasn't coercion and that might interact with a standing question that that i said i would largely set aside it may be they'd say look you know as to the things that happened to these particular plaintiffs we don't think we don't think there's evidence that their speech was restricted be, based on coercion maybe some other actions might have been coercive but they're not fully implicated on this record it sounded to me in other words like the challenges would lose on both the coercion and the and the significant encouragement argument. Coercion that lose on the facts, facts or right. possibly on standing, whereas significant encouragement that lose purely on the law saying, you know, there's nothing unconstitutional. There's nothing possible. other than coercion that would but, separate. But boy, have I been wrong before in predicting what the justices <laughs> uh, will do. It's possible. So I, I especially want to ask you about what you think um, Justice uh, Brown uh, Jackson uh, is likely to do or say or perhaps write separately about. But before I do, I think one reason I find it hard to predict this case, I know most most of the public media that I've read has suggested that the, it seemed like the judges were very, justices were very skeptical of the Fifth Circuit's approach and and of the plaintiffs in this case. I found it hard to determine because the Louisiana Solicitor General, who happened to be arguing on this day, took such an extreme position. So yeah, more I'm extreme not than sure, the and more extreme than the justices have are are compelled to you know have have to take on. So so for example, Kavanaugh. I don't actually know where Kavanaugh's head is. I know he gave the example of the sorts of encouragement that he <laughs> used when he was working uh, in the in the in white in the White House or the DOJ. Um, I don't know what he thinks, though, about these facts, even on a coercion standard. Um, Kagan, I think, seemed to suggest that she actually just wants to dispose of this on, on standing this issue that I agree we should sideline. This question of whether these particular plaintiffs were harmed enough, prov provably harmed by what the government had done and are likely to be harmed going forward. 
um, which is a way of just not deciding the ultimate legal question that you and I are discussing. But Justice Jackson is way out there, I think. So let, let's listen to a clip uh, with her. And so I, I guess some might say that the government actually has a duty to take steps to protect the citizens of this country. And you seem to be suggesting that that duty cannot manifest itself in the government encouraging or even pressuring uh, platforms to take down harmful information. So can you help me? Because I'm really, I'm, I'm really worried about that um, because you've got the First Amendment operating um, in an environment of threatening circumstances from the government's perspective and you're saying that the government can't interact with the source of th those problems. And Your Honor, I understand that instinct, and I guess what I tell you is the, our position is not that the government can't interact with the platforms there. They can and they should in certain circumstances like that that present such dangerous issues for society and especially young people. But the way they do that has to be in compliance with the First Amendment. So Eugene, what do you think Justice Jackson's rule would be if, if, if she were to, to make one here? Well, I'm not sure what what she would say in this particular case to dispose of, of these issues. But it looks like, more generally, in her statements in the argument, she is uh, uh, signaling that she would, in general, be more open to government restrictions on speech, not just government's attempt to persuade, but even government's attempt to she used the word Com pressure here, compel, but in other situations, but even compel, she even yeah. said coerce and compel. Yes. Yeah. Um, and I, I uh, listened to the argument, and I went through the the transcript. I found seven instances in which she separately was talking about how, as to certain kinds of things, the government ought to be able to coercively block it. One example that she gave uh, was uh, uh, oh, classified information. So she says, uh, uh, what about the hypo of someone posting classified information? Are you suggesting that the government couldn't say to the platforms, we need to take that down? And earlier she had said, tell them that the government should be able to, quote, tell them to take it down, close quote. And she said earlier in that same passage about that the government can, in cer certain circumstances, encourage, perhaps even coerce mm -hmm. certain kinds of restrictions. It yeah. sounds to me like Justice Jackson has a somewhat narrower view of free speech protections than some of the other justices. Other justices have 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 likewise had a narrower view. Um, her uh, the justice she replaced and the justice she clerked for, Justice Breyer, also at times he had uh, he was willing to vote to strike down speech restrictions on, on many occasions. But more broadly, he embraced uh, an approach to uh, free speech. Uh, to uh, uh, speech protections uh, that uh, sometimes was called balancing or sometimes proportionality, suggesting that perhaps the government ought to have more authority. Other justices in the past, quite respected justices, Justice Rehnquist, who was a prominent conservative, at least earlier in his career, uh, had a pretty narrow view of speech protection. Justice Frankfurter, who was a uh, FDR appointee, who was many ways politically a liberal, but jurisprudentially something of a conservative, he also was willing to see a lot more um, uh, 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 latitude for government uh, speech restrictions through a kind of balancing approach. Now, uh, Jackson might use a somewhat, Justice Jackson might use a somewhat different test, maybe a so-called strict scrutiny test, which is the official test, but one where the strictness of the scrutiny is is. Uh, a little more deferential. Balance. One interesting thing is the classified information example. That's the Pentagon Papers case. Yeah, it is. In 1971, oh. the court by a 6-3 vote said, well, if a newspaper is about to itself publish classified information, the government can't compel it to take it down, compel it not to publish it. Right. Just at means, least, it just means at least she was with the three dissenters. Uh, those yeah. are, that's a perfectly reasonable position that the dissenters, in that case, I believe it was Harlan, uh, uh, Berger, and Blackman took. But I do think that she is charting a more speech protective, friendly approach, at least in certain kinds of situations. Uh, even setting aside the question of speech, encur of, of encouragement that platforms right, right. restrict speech, I think she would be more open even to outright compulsion on platforms to restrict speech. So, so I think you're right. Here's the one way in which I, 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 she's either confused or 
helping the plaintiff's side because what the way she described her examples and the way she seemed to be conceptualizing um, the uh, First Amendment in these cases suggests that she has assumed that the First Amendment applies. So it seems to me that eight of the justices or maybe seven or so and the litigants are debating whether there's state action here or not. Um, Jackson seems to bypass that question, perhaps even conceding it, uh, in order to say, yes, okay, there's state action. There's even if there's compulsion that they may have a of a, a, a duty, a practical responsibility to do so, and that would not violate First Amendment uh, rights. And so, I am not sure whether she, um, you know, wh wh whether she's sh she's actually just not even focusing on the state action question or um, not aware that she doesn't even need to get to the question of what happens under scrutiny. I think she knows what's going on. I don't think she's confused. I do think she has a different perspective. So um, uh, the, the two main views here uh, are, some justices, probably a majority say, there's a big, big difference between encouragement and compulsion. And yeah. compulsion is bad, but encouragement is fine. And then there are saying... some justices, probably Justices Alito and Thomas, who seem to be taking the view that, well, the difference is overstated, uh, that really compulsion is bad, but substantial encouragement is bad, too. She seems to be saying compulsion can be good. The difference is overstated. Both might be just fine. There's a particular passage. Let me quote it. She says, you want us to take the line to be between compulsion and encouragement. I'm wondering whether that's not really the line. The line is, does the government have a compelling interest in doing things that result in restricting the speech in this way? Here's the thing, though, Eugene. I, she several times, though, um, asked whether, whether the position was that once you find compulsion at all, the government automatically loses. And the the responding attorney said, well, no, at that point we go through with the, you know, basically the state action, the state action at that point applies. And so then we have to ask whether the government's action was justified under, uh, under strict or whatever level of scrutiny is required. Uh, and her, her going back over and over again, though, asking, well, if we find that there was state action, does that mean the government loses? Suggest I th I think there's genuine confusion. I have to say, right? I so the, way, the whole thing, <laughs> right? The way that I understood those exchanges uh, were that uh, um, both sides, uh, or both she and the the challenger's uh, lawyer, agreed that if the speech, uh, uh, if there is government action that triggers the First Amendment. Uh, the government will only win if it can show that the restriction is narrowly tailored to a compelling government interest. Passes. Strictly. I think it took them a long time to actually get there. So maybe in part because that had been so little discussed in the briefing and the the arguments below. Right. But um, uh, it seemed pretty clear that the challenger's lawyer. His view was, well, obviously, it's unconstitutional to restrict this kind of speech because it isn't narrowly tailored to compelling government interest. That's an extremely yeah. demanding standard, right. and it can't be satisfied here. The government can't say, well, we've got a strict, uh, we, we, sorry, we've got a compelling interest in banning dissenting views on all these subjects, so therefore we're allowed to ban them. And her view seemed to be, well, maybe, maybe if the government says, you know, certain kinds of views about vaccines or about various other things are really, really bad, then the government ought to be free uh, to restrict them. So I do think there's an important substantive disagreement there. But she may be a vote, ironically, in favor of, okay, fine, there's state action, right? There's state action. And then when you get to the second step of asking whether the uh, the government action was uh, was constitutional or not? At that point, she would fall away. But how how? Well, but you know, it happens. You know, sometimes the, the, there are cases which actually cause a lot of confusion. I don't think it's going to be one of them. Yeah. But right. sometimes it's a four like one four, four opinions. Yeah. Four justices would vote one way for one reason. Yes. Four justices yeah. would vote another way for another reason. 
And the one yes. just says, well, I agree with yeah. the parts of what this one. of yeah. what uh, the, uh, the the plurality says, parts of what the dissent says, but I've got my own theory, which leads me to a different result. And then you wonder what's the precedent for the future. Here, my guess is there are going to be five votes, again, for the proposition that substantial uh, encouragement is just not unconstitutional. It is actually, substantial encouragement is state action. It's just state action that doesn't implicate the First Amendment because it's not state restriction wow. of okay. speech, just yeah. state yeah. urging with regard to speech. I see. Um, okay. uh, I think there will probably be five votes for that, maybe more, and maybe maybe Justice Jackson um, would be one of the votes there. But it does seem like looking forward to, to, to the future, in other cases, I would expect her to at times say, look, this yeah. is a speech restriction, but it's permissible but it's speech. It's okay, right. Because the government yeah. has to have the latitude to restrict speech that's really, really harmful. I agree. So I think we should leave it there. Uh, <laughs> yes. Well, we could talk for many hours on end, but people can't <laughs> listen for many hours on end. So uh, uh, it's always a great pleasure discussing these things with you. Yep. Thanks, everyone. We'll, we'll see you in the next episode.